Welcome to the Being Known Podcast with my friend, Dr. Kurt Thompson. And my friend, Pepper Sweeney. We are here to discover and explore what it means to be truly known. Hey, Kurt. Pep, great to see you again. You're back from vacation. I am back great. from vacation. Thank you. I feel good. It's, as, we said, uh, as we were saying earlier, tanned, rested, and ready. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I go to the dermatologist next week. They'll slap me down. <laughs> They'll slap me down real quick about being tanned and rested. <laughs> oh, yeah. gracious. Yeah. Mm. So today um, we are, as as uh, you may know, if you've been listening to this season of the podcast, we are going through Kurt Thompson's second book, The Soul of Shame. And if you haven't picked it up already, I highly recommend that you do so that you can um, be reading the chapters along with us and, uh, and then enjoying the podcast as, um, sort of something that's going to back up all the things that you're, that you're reading. And uh, this week we are on chapter four and the title of this chapter is the story of shame you are living. And Kurt, um, I think you should start us off, um, to sort of set, set the tone for today. Let us know what we're going to be, where we're going to be going. So we've been talking thus far in this season uh, about some of the mechanics of shame. We've we've talked about kind of how it operates in the brain. We've talked about that whole notion of a, you know, this standard transmission operating system in a car, the accelerator, the brake, the clutch. We've talked about the different ways that shame uh, shears things off both in one's own mind, in the brain, and also between people. But we've also said it, you know, at the outset, we, we said we, we want to remember that uh, we are people who live in the middle of stories. We are like we, we are telling stories about ourselves all the time, which is shame isn't just a mechanical thing that happens out there in the abstract. It is embedded in the stories that we tell. And today we are going to really explore how those things converge, how it is, first of all, that we are storytellers and why and how it is then that the, that the mechanics of shame you know play a role in that and, and so we, we like to talk about this notion that we're moving from mechanics to meaning and this whole notion that um we are creatures uh, as we'll talk about in a little more detail in just a moment we are creatures who are always telling stories even if we don't know that that's what we're doing and I, I begin with this, uh, you know, we have an example from the from the book, but a, a patient of mine, Robert is his name, and he came to see me. He was had a, had a history of depression. It had taken him a long time to get to the office. And some of the reason it had taken him a long time was because he had been so depressed. And by the time he got there, his understanding, he was a really bright guy. His understanding was that this is a condition that I have, and I think that there are probably some things, maybe I have to do some cognitive behavioral work, but I you need to get medication and then my problem will be gone. I will, I will no longer have a problem. Like my, my depression really is just this thing that I have. And of course, in the, in the course of doing a complete psychiatric evaluation, we ask other kinds of questions and including, which we find to be really important questions having to do with what people make of their lives like what's the meaning like where where's where, where's the meaning that you that you derive now I, I think it's important to say for all of our listeners that if you were to ask me that question and i were at, at a time when i'm depressed even my capacity to answer that question thoughtfully might be impaired and so i taking that into consideration for robert when when a person is depressed, the whole notion of being thoughtful and reflective about what our, you know, stories really are, like, that's not always easy to do because my brain is on lockdown. That's not just because of my story. That's because neurobiologically, I'm in a hard place. But what was interesting to me was that Robert was able, in that moment when I asked him that question, Robert was able to acknowledge that he didn't think that meaning had anything to do with his condition at all. I mean, he, he was aware enough, not just to say like, oh, I can't think about that. He was aware enough to say, I don't like that. I, I don't really think that that matters. I, I don't know why we're talking about this. Not just that he couldn't, but that he didn't know what was important about this. And of course, the more we began 
to explore some of these things. And, and, and he was a guy who we, we did start a course of antidepressant medication. And there were some tactical things that we needed to do to have him. We started to have him start to exercise, start to do some other things that he didn't really feel like doing at first. But over the course of all of that, his brain started to wake up more and more. And he began to recognize that, my goodness, this condition in which I find myself, this depression, is not just a thing that happens to me. It just doesn't come over me like COVID, like a like a virus and it infects me and then there it is. It is a thing that gradually came upon me over time. And once it kind of found a foothold, then it found a beachhead, then then it took the continent. In no small part, because of the story right. that he had been telling throughout the course of his life. Yeah. It, 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 and it starts very, very young, as you, as you talk about in the book, the pre-language, right? Right. Right. This we talk. We've 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 said in previous episodes. We talk about one of the ways that we talk about the definition of the mind is this emerging process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Mm -hmm. And this energy, this this experience of what we sense and image and feel, and all this neurobiological and interpersonal energy. Literally, that's not just a metaphor. That's real. It's the physics of energy. We are having these experiences. And eventually we, as, as we like to say, we operate bottom to top and right to left. Eventually we become these storytellers, this infant, we have to make a meaning. We have to make sense of these things that we sense. I was, uh, recently, uh, listening to an interview, uh, of the British evolutionary biologist, Simon Conway Morris, and he is well known in his field and uh, I, I i didn't i didn't know of him because that's that's not my field but he's well known in his field and one of the things that he talks about and he's and he's uh, he is he's not not a believer he's he, he identifies himself as a person who believes in 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 the supernatural in, in a god he's not sure about christianity although he had exposure to that as a kid but he's deeply familiar with the process of evolution. And one of the things that he points out is that we are the species that tell stories, which is really interesting to hear a person with his credentials yeah. say that like what really for him, like you, you can, lots of people will say, well, what sets homo sapiens apart? What sets us apart from all other living creatures and we might say, oh, our sentient minds, like our, well, you know, we, we presume that a dog is sentient, like it's, it's aware of, of certain things. And like, especially if you're in a Gary Larson, you know, comic strip, <laughs> like you're like super aware of it. You're more aware of things than the humans are. Yeah. Like I, I sometimes wish I, I mean, well, I, I mean, like, I, I don't know that getting my wish would be a good thing, but I sometimes wish like, I would, I would love for a day to live in Gary Larson, like a, a world that he creates. And what would it be like to come around the corner and, and see dinosaurs smoking cigarettes to discover this is, <laughs> Very this, is how they, this is how they really died? He said he was always afraid one day he was going to wake up and realize that it wasn't really his life that he was living. Like he was, you know, that's how much he loved what he was doing. Yeah. 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 Talent. Yeah. So like even Gary Larson, for instance, like, like if, imagine how he tells stories. Like he's like, we even, we even want we don't just tell stories we tell stories in which we want other creatures who typically don't to be able to tell stories right we want them to be able, like we believe that a dog really is having thoughts about us we want that to be so true and this is the thing that we don't just tell them randomly there is a particular and a peculiar way that we do tell them like we sense things right we talk about this bottom to top right to left phenomenon of the you know, the spinal cord brainstem to, you know, midbrain, right hemisphere, left hemisphere, you know, movement in which we eventually give meaning to all the things that we are experiencing. And that leads then to this crucial goal. And, and, and again, this isn't a thing that we have to go to school to learn to do. Like we are doing this from the moment that children pick up words. You notice children pick up the intention of their adults, uh, their adult caregivers, and they, the children, you start to see the stories form. We were, I was, I just got back from vacation and we uh, had the, um, my nephew was there and he has young kids and his son is, is really young. And there was a, an Alexa in the, in the house we were oh staying in. 
and he says, Hey, Alexa, play proud Mary. <laughs> he, he was entertaining us to no end. Just, you know, a little, could barely even say it. And he was down there singing it. And it was really fun. Wow. Really okay. Fun. So you imagine, so, so about how old would your nephew's son be? Uh, he's only, I mean, he's a toddler, you know? So yeah. 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 Just forming so about, his language. Right. Just now. But, but even as a toddler, you can imagine that the toddler is not just asking Alexa to play a song. The toddler at some level is aware of the other people in the room yeah. and is anticipating not just the proud, not just proud Mary right. is anticipating what's going to happen in the room. That toddler already is imagining a story that's about to unfold. Hmm. We don't have any evidence that elk do this. Right. We don't we don't have evidence that other th there is a way in which we tell stories that is part is, is a crucial part of how it is that we as human beings are to have dominion over the earth mm. from Genesis chapter one. That there is that part of how we have dominion is we tell stories about the way the world is and is going to be. And so one of the crucial questions that we ask patients and that, and that we and you know that we that all of us other as we're all listening together we ask this question you know every, every every moment like what is the story in which i believe i'm living in what story am i living i think we've covered this a little bit before in other episodes but this this sense of like oh i i i'd, I'd like to say that I, I i believe that i live in the biblical narrative in the story that is somewhere between the ascension of jesus and his appearance that's coming that may come tomorrow it may come ten thousand years from now we're living somewhere in between that but that's a story that i'm telling but there are many moments of many days in which i live as if i don't believe i'm in that story i believe i'm in the story in which if i don't get what i need right now I am not, I'm not going to be okay. Like I'm, 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 I'm going to be devoured by the moment. I'm going to be overwhelmed. I'm, you know, if I, if I can't get that, if I, if I don't get the last two cookies, I mean, like, this is really not, I mean, like, I'm not even kidding. When my wife makes homemade chocolate chip cookies, I am a brute. Like you do not want to be in my way. You do not want to be between me and the homemade cookies. And so like, it's like, she's, she's making two dozen cookies because we're having guests come over, right? We're gonna have a two dozen cookies. And I'm already like, so the first thing, like once she puts them out on the counter, I'm like, well, I, you know, I want to make sure that they're okay, that they meet standards. Right. So sure. I need to try, I, I need to try one or five. What, you know, I, I, I gotta, I gotta try one. And then of course, like I'm monitoring the consumption of these cookies throughout the evening because <laughs> I mean, this is like, can you imagine people pay me money to have as their psychiatrist and this is who they're dealing with. Yeah. And I, I do like, I'm like, speaking of toddler, like I'm like your nephew's son. You know, I was driving, we drove to on vacation and it was a, it was a, uh, about a 10 hour 10, well, I was 13 on the way down because of bad weather, but it was about a 10 hour on the way back. And I, I find myself because I drive, I like to drive. So I, mm -hmm. I, I just stay behind the wheel the whole time. And so about four or five hours in, I find myself like telling stories about all the people around me and like, that guy can't beat me. And when you start getting, <laughs> when you start getting competitive with the other drivers on the exactly. freeway, they're thinking, Sorry. we're not pulling off. We're not right. pulling off. Our <laughs> ass up here because, no, no, because <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm monitoring the vehicles such that like when I put, if I had to pull off, I'm like, okay, I I'm gonna catch, catch that. that dude. I'm gonna catch that dude in about <laughs> ten miles. Like I'm gonna I'm catch glad that dude it's in ten not miles. Only me. Oh my gosh! Like, this is, like these are the things that go in and run. Like it's too bad that Gary Larson didn't have access to our minds. Like yeah, he would he, have. He, he, he might have had a career then. He, he might have. He, he might have. <laughs> but this is what we do. We're telling these stories all right. the time. And we like to talk about how we tell them on macroscopic levels, we tell them on microscopic levels, and then there's anything in between. And these macroscopic levels might be things like, uh, you know, I, I believe the world is fundamentally good, or I believe the world is fundamentally going to hell in a handbasket, or I believe people are fundamentally good, or people are fundamentally evil. All these, or I believe in God, I don't believe in God. I believe in the gospel, I believe in Jesus, or like, I don't think, there are all those kind of large things 
that we don't think about very often explicitly. But then there are these, what we might call intermediate stories that are more proximal. Uh, some of them are like so proximal, we might call them microscopic stories, kind of like, oh my gosh, like I have to go to the bathroom. Like I become aware, like, and, and, but I'm aware that I should have gone 10 minutes ago before the next session started. Right. There are those, there are those moments or like, man, I'm really thirsty. I want to get, to, oh yeah, that's right. There is, there, we've got that new fresh lemonade that's in, in, in I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to really enjoy that. Like the, these moments. And then there, then there's these things that are other, other ways that our stories shape is kind of like. I'm so angry at my dad and I don't have a way to resolve that. Gosh, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to keep my job or we're like, oh my gosh, I'm, I think he likes me. And I tell the story about what like that, that, that matters. I'm so worried about my son who has autism. The story that I tell about that, that I get reminded of every day. These are, these are stories that we are telling. They aren't just things that are happening to happen in our world. They're things that we are sensing, imaging, feeling, and thinking, and then we are making meaning. We are active participants. Whether we know it or not, we are exercising dominion over the world through the stories that we tell. That's how we do it. And the question again always is, in what story do I believe that I'm living? And I'm, I'm aware that I frequently, uh, I, I just run, I, I run off the road of the story that I want to be telling. I run down into, you know, I go off-roading into places of like, I'm, I'm not wantable. You know, I, I have this, I, I, you know, I, I have, I do, I mean, for real, like I do have this one part of me that kind of Times it comes into center stage and other times it's backstage, but it's this part that like believes he's unwantable. Like it's, 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 it's there. It's not like, oh, we can, we, we can have a 10 minute conversation and uh, convince him otherwise. And then he'll just like, like give up his job. Right. No, I mean, that part's pretty embedded in me. It's not a matter of it going to go away completely. It's a matter of like, I'm going to have to work with this part until I'm dead. And so, uh, you know, it, that's, that's the part that informs the story in which like, if I, if, if I sense something, even, even here, if I sense something in you and Amy, if I, if, if I sense a moment in which like, we're not completely okay, like it's that part of me that is like trying to get onto the stage. That's, and it's a story, it's a storyteller. And so we have these large stories, mac macroscopic, these microscopics and everything in between. And it, they all point to these different features that stories have these features. They, we, we, one of the things that we like to say about stories is that they always begin with someone else. Our stories begin with someone else. My parents, as I may have shared in other, other episodes, my, my parents were in their mid forties when I was, when they, when my mom got pregnant with me and uh, you, you know, we say that like my mom got pregnant, even the way I tell it, like my mom, my mom got pregnant. She went to the grocery store and she found out that she got pregnant. Kind of like she got a virus. Like, as if like, she, it just happened to happen. Is it like my mom got pregnant as if my dad somehow was like, he was, he was at work and like somehow just magically. Let's hope he wasn't at work. That's right. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm told, I'm told that he was there when it happened. I, that's what I'm told. But you know, the, this, this sense that they're pregnant in their mid forties and in 1962, like that's anxiety provoking. Sure. And so their sense of me was that I was a source of anxiety. Now it, it's not like they're thinking this consciously. They're not saying to themselves and to each other, this is horrible. This is, but these are things that are feeling, I, I don't have it. If I, if I had it, I would, I would show it on our, on our YouTube video. I have a picture of my parents sitting on the couch the night before I was born. You, you'd think that they want that one or both of them had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. Uh. Now, granted, like, you know, she's with her fourth kid. It's been 11 years since she's had a baby. We thought we were done with this. She's pregnant in nine months. She's ready to go. And like, we're like tired. And whatever. I, I get, but like, there's, you know, there's like, there's not even the faintest hint of like, oh my gosh, this is, this is going to be like, you know, when we first got the news, this is hard, but like, we were so glad like, you, you, like, that's not a story that you would tell if you were to look at that picture. So there, my story is being told by somebody else long before I ever enter. And for all of our listeners, somebody else is telling your story long before you ever got here. 
And that then leads to the next feature about storytelling, and that is that they are always and forever told collaboratively. You come into the world and people continue to tell stories about you. They put you in certain clothes. They send you to certain play dates, things that you don't want to do, things you would never wear now, things that you would, people you would never be with if you had your choice. But they're going to tell the story like, oh, it's my best friend. Her kid's here. You're, you're going to be friends with like, no, I hate Joey. I don't really, I don't want to come back to Joey's house ever again. But like, you love Sarah. So I guess we're going to have to do this. They're telling our story, even in ways that are congruent or incongruent with the things that we are sensing. So one of the questions becomes, in what way is my story seen by my parents in such a way that attachment mm -hmm. can form in a secure way? One of the things that we talk about in terms of attachment processes, that forms of attachment are insecure or secure forms, have everything to do with how we make sense, how we tell stories about our lives in relationship to other people because our stories are always told collaboratively. As we age, we take over more and more and more of the script of the story that we're telling, but it is never without someone else being in the room helping us tell that story. And so one of the crucial questions for us becomes, who are the people who are in our lives who are continually helping us tell our stories more truly? Because it never stops. As we are, Made, made as we are in the image of a triune God, a relational God who are helping each other. They tell each other the story of who they are at all times. Made in their image, that's how we're made to do the same thing. Moreover, you know, when we think about story, we're such wordy people, we often miss the fact that so much of our stories that are told are non-conscious and non-verbal. It's like we, we, if you go to a really good movie, you wouldn't want to go in and the lights go out and then all you hear is dialogue. No, you want music and you want video and you, you want all the things. You want all the nonverbal sensations, all the things. And so I cross my arms when I walk into a room, maybe because I'm cold, maybe because I'm like nervous. And I send a message. I tell the story to someone else. I'm not okay. Stay away. I'm sending that message to somebody else. You stay away. I'm going to posture myself this way. But what I fail to see sometimes is that I'm, I'm telling that same story. To, I'm telling the story to myself that says, like, Kurt, you're not okay. You're not okay here. You're not at ease. And so even with our nonverbal cues, our nonverbal, all the things that we sense in image, we are continuing to tell. So, so much of our story that is told is told non-consciously and non-verbally. But another thing that's important is that we want to tell our stories in order for them to be heard. That toddler, your nephew's toddler, if nobody else is in the room, he may not even ask Alexa to play Proud Mary. Right. Because there's nobody there to hear him tell the story. We long to be seen. We long to be heard. We long for our stories to be told. Ask any mu musical performer, ask any great artist, ask, ask, ask any artist, right? right? Ask him, like, I, I paint because I really do long. Now, I might, I might be nervous about this. It might be a little anxiety provoking when I, you know, put my show up in a gallery, but I put my show up in a gallery because I, 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 I really want it to be seen. Yeah. I think about, I mean, I, I'd love to hear you talk more about I, like how you tell as an actor, man. Well, I mean, you know, the first thing is, is, is that trying to make someone else's words, your story, oh. you know, that's, that's where it starts. You know, it's not talk about someone else telling, you know, creating your story, you know, yeah. from the beginning, you, you, this, this script, you have to you know, find the things um, that you can relate to about the character and things that those things that you can't relate to, finding a way to relate to them so that you can tell it truthfully, because the, the goal of the actor is to present um, the character and the story as truthful as possible. Um, and, the, you know, um, my teacher, who we've talked about before, Charles Nelson Riley, would say that um the author's job is the black on the page and the writer's is the white between 
I mean, mm. the, the actors is the white between. So you've got to fill in all the white, got to mm. fill in all the white spaces. Um, and, and that work starts with the script, but then you've, there is a lot of white space that you've got to fill out <clears throat> as an right. actor to help tell the story. Right. You know? Yeah. And when it's, when it's done collaboratively, that's when it's the best. I was thinking um, about that collaboration this, this morning. And I was thinking about a play that I did <clears throat> years ago called Wild Oats. And it's this Western farce, right? It's this crazy, <laughs> crazy <laughs> thing. And in the middle of the play, the main character takes a train to another town. And so all of the actors, we became the train together. <laughs> and, and it was actually incredible. Like we huh. were all those things and, and the audience was kind of taken away by that, by yeah. that moment of, yeah. you know, us collaboratively coming together and, and creating that image and that feeling on the stage. Right. Right. Yeah. But right. it's, yeah, it starts with, with someone else telling the story and then you figuring out um how to fill in the gaps well i and i'm i'm, I'm also um I, I know that you've you've told the story before um of your being the grocery delivery boy right man. and one of the things that if i, if I remember correctly if i'm if, if i'm getting this yeah. right if I, if I remember that you do i remember that you went to a grocery store just, just in my mind, although in, I have but, done but, that kind but, of work before where you, where you, you know, you physically try to do the things, but yeah. Yeah. Right. But, but I'm saying like, you didn't just look at the script. Right. And then show up on the stage, having memorized the script. Right. Long before that, in your mind, you are doing all the work that that young yeah. man would do. Putting my apron on in the back room going, you know, coming to work, picking out the groceries that I need to deliver these things. Yeah. All that stuff mm -hmm. you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're doing mentally because you bring that on, you bring those thoughts and that energy on stage with you when you come on and people can pick up on that as, you know, I've told this story before, but, um, uh, to give the reader's digest version this particular night. So I, I routed out my whole route mentally as I'm preparing to go on stage and, and, uh, when I got to the apartment building, the elevator was broken. And so in my mind on this particular <laughs> night, for whatever reason. And so I took the stairs and came on stage. I did the scene and I got off and the director was sitting off stage um, when I came off. And she said, what happened to the elevator? Oh, my gosh. Right. I mean, like I, I got I, I got goosebumps on my art. I've heard this story a dozen right. times and I and I want to hear it another dozen times. Because every time you say that, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, it's, it, and it's just a, you know, that, that's what I mean by filling in the white. The, the, the actor has to fill in all the white parts on the page because you've got to create a history. You've got, otherwise, if, like you said, if you're just somebody that's memorizing lines and coming on stage, it's so not compelling. It's, right. you know, you, you, you see a flatness in that performance. There's no depth. There's no, you know, it's not a three-dimensional person. Right. So I got a question for you. I don't think I've asked you this. What was it like for you to hear the director make that observation? It was eye-opening. I mean, I, I, you know, like this was, I was a young, I was an apprentice. I was a young actor and um, was really in an environment where I was learning every day mm -hmm. and trying new things and, and trying to learn this craft and all this kind of thing. And um, for me, you know, to do the homework, to do the work, and then I was shocked that she, because I didn't, I, as I told you before, I wasn't like huffing and puffing from the staircase. I was, it was just a thoughts that I brought on stage mm -hmm. with myself mm -hmm. of this, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and I probably had an attitude about it or whatever, as I came on, that was different. And the fact that she saw that, mm -hmm. um, you know, really solidified that I was on the right track mm -hmm. as a young actor. Um, this role was a very small role. So it, it, it afforded me the luxury of time to be able to really dig into these things. And it made me realize that you need to do that for all, all the parts that you play and all the work that you do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I was kind of, I was, when she first said it, I was in shock. I'm like, mm -hmm. how did you <laughs> know? And she, her explain, explanation was, you know, thoughts have energy and you brought that on stage. And that's, um, 
that's how I knew. Right. Yeah. I think, I think that this, you know, this, uh, I, I wonder also like how that, like her recognition of that, I wonder how, I'm wondering like, what's your sense of, and you know, to what degree that shaped or encouraged or reinforced your confidence that like, oh, this, this is good for me to do this. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So 100%. Forth. 100%. It was, uh, you know, I, I'd go so far as to say as, as far as that portion of my life and, and going after that career and learning that craft, it was a turning point for me. Wow. Like it was a real place where I was like, okay, right. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know I can do this. And if I do, you know, it's just about doing the work mm -hmm. and, um, and I felt like I was on the right path for sure. Right. Right. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to come back to this in our next episode, this whole notion of doing the work, but this leads to this last feature of storytelling that I want to emphasize. And that is that, you know, if, if I, I mean, as an actor, you know, it's, it's, uh, you can imagine if you're playing to a full house, that's a little different than if you're playing to a house that's only half full. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the plays that I did in these little 99 seat theaters in LA, we would be backstage and we would vote because if there were more people in the audience than there were in the cast, we would vote to see if we would actually do the show. We'd always do the show, but we sometimes we'd do it to like three people. It was miserable. Uh, oh oh so. my gosh. Right. Well, and so, so this, this whole notion then that not unlike you as the actor in, in these 99 seat, you know, uh, theaters, we tell our stories, but the ones who listen also help us tell them. Hmm. It is the presence of others. It is the, I, I, as a storyteller, I don't just want my story to be heard. I want to tell my story. For you. But it is, as it turns out, your presence also is what enables me. It tells the story. It is helping me tell the story. When your director offers that reflection to you, you discover that she now has entered into your story as part of the, she's a teller and, and her reflecting that her indicates she's, she's paying attention to what you're doing. She's listening. She's watching. She's sensing she's, she's receiving you. And as such, she's helping you tell the story so that you then say like, oh, this is, this is what I need. This is a turning point. Her listening is helping you further tell your story. And so this is another thing uh, for our listeners to, to remember that anytime we are the listeners of someone telling us of their story, uh, remember that like we are helping to tell it by our very presence of listening and attunement. And I don't want to go off on a tangent here too much, but yeah. didn't, didn't um, you say that, uh, when someone is listening to you and hearing you and responding and you know that they're listening and paying attention that there are neurological changes going on in your right. brain right well i mean in many respects that attunement yep. that they are offering that attunement is actively in that moment connecting their right hemisphere to my right hemisphere like my their, my, their right hemisphere is turning on my right hemisphere mm -hmm. and it means it gives me that much even that much more freedom Right. It's like if I'm about to say something to someone that is going to feel embarrassing, for instance, or, or difficult to say. And as I start to talk, I without maybe even noticing it, I probably won't even notice if I notice that their that their gaze and their posture remains soft and receptive. And I said the first sentence and maybe perhaps I get a response of empathy or at, least, at the very least neutral. They're not angry. They're not harsh like I feel the lightning in my chest. I feel the, the, I feel a certain lightness and I am, I'm, I'm more willing to say more, more willing to say more. There is more of my story that is being told and because my brain is being turned on by their brain by virtue of their receptivity. And not only is it being turned on, but there's a certain connectivity between my right and my left hemisphere that is now taking place in a particular way that otherwise wouldn't take place. I keep like, there's certain things that we just don't ever say. I don't ever let myself say them out loud. And so instead I have to contain that emotional distress in some way, shape or form. And I do so in my body because it's the only place I can contain anything. We might think, oh, I just, it's just, a, I contain it as a thought. No, like the emotional energy that that thought, you know, represents 
like I have to like physics, the physics of energy, you can't create it or destroy it. You have to, it, you only, it only changes like form. Like it's gotta be it, the form of it has to be contained someplace. And so when we are telling our stories more adaptively, we become more integrated human beings, quite literally, even in our brains. And this, of course, this whole process of how we tell stories is exactly what evil wants to take advantage of. And we're going to talk about this in the next episode. But it's here that we introduce this notion uh, that uh, we've talked about on other occasions, this notion of having our own shame attendant, this our own personal attendant whose job it is it's the, the like narrator a valet. like your own personal right. valet yeah, my own personal Machine valet, valet. Right. right exactly and i like and i think i, I you know I, I gave it that name with like wouldn't wait wouldn't it shouldn't it be better to be like the shame persecutor the child? like no like this is this is how evil is so subtle right as we'll talk about it, 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 this the subtlety of this this notion that like he's the narrator who came for dinner and stayed indefinitely because our neural entanglement, it like becomes the Gordian knot of life where in all these places. So like in Robert's story, as his story unfolded, we came to discover that there was lots of anxiety on his mother's part for him. And his father became irritated at his mother's anxiety, thinking that his mother's anxiety is going to, you know, turn Robert into a cream puff. And so the father would get irritated at his mother. And then he pushed Robert to do things that Robert wasn't really quite ready or able to do. And so the story that Robert would end up telling, even though when he came into my office, he wasn't, I mean, he just thought he was depressed. That's the, like, that's the problem. But the whole notion that he'd spent a lifetime telling a story of I'm not okay, you know, was not easy to register with him. But by the time we started to say, this is what your shame attendant is doing. Every day you wake up, you're not okay. Just want to remind you, I know that you're about to take this new job. You're probably not going to do very well at it. Well, and I, I, I've tend to people in my life, if I hear them, there's, I hear their shame attendant coming out of their own mouth. Mm -hmm. I want to just say, that's a lie. Yeah. You know, you're living a lie. And then you think that if the person realizes it's a lie, then we can move on. And, you know, but right. as you talk about in the book, that's not, it's a lot more complicated than that. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it's more complicated because of our, because of the way that we're made, our neural circuitry, because of how it gets embedded fairly, uh, you know, fairly deeply. And, and, and we, and we might say, you know, it's going to be there for a long time, which requires then a different kind of attunement and attention to it in order for us to address that shame attendant that we would like to just fire and get rid of them. But we recognize we just have to, over time, as we'll see, we're just going to give them less and less and less work to do. We're not, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to be, uh, eventually work themselves out of a job. This week, uh, as we come to the end of our time, um, we have an application for our listeners. And uh, I want to just wanna invite you to take some time to begin to pay attention to your story. A um, number of ways that you can do this. You can begin by writing about it. One of the ways that we recommend that people do it, just take 30 minutes and you can begin to write anything that you want to about your memories of your life a decade at a time. Take 30 minutes to write about your first decade and second decade and so forth. And as you do so, as you write, and we, I, I, I you know, invite people to do this by hand because it slows the process down. It allows the affect and the emotion and the sense to be more accessible to your awareness. And as you do so, pay attention especially to what and to how you're paying attention to your story. At what level are you paying attention to the macroscopic level, the microscopic level? What are what parts of your story are you turning your attention toward? What's important? And also begin to pay attention to what you're sensing or imaging or feeling or thinking or the impulse that you have to act with your body in any way that's associated with that sensation of shame that we've talked about. Anytime that starts to show up, be curious about where that is. And then without any judgment, be curious about how long you've told that part of your story. And when you first recall telling it that way, who were the people that were involved or were around you when that was happening? Keeping those storylines in your awareness as you begin to allow God to add his own lines that will enable you to tell your story differently. And God's involvement in this whole storytelling venture is something we'll start to 
pay attention to in our next episode. Can't wait. This was great today, Kurt. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Appreciate it. Um, until next time. Until next time. And uh, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, we have our bonus footage coming up with uh, producer Amy. So stick around for that. Love you, Kurt. Love you, man. Oh my gosh. I, I have so much. I'm going to have to pare it down. First, okay, Pep, we've got to get you to tell that story of taking the stairs. Because I'm with Kurt. I've heard that story so many times. And every time I hear it, when you say, she said, what happened to the elevator? I'm just like, oh my gosh. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, okay, there were so many things. Like... Pep, when you said you guys would tell it to three people and then Kurt, you're like, the stories are told to be heard. Hmm. And then you say in the book, Kurt, you don't, you don't like it when you're telling a story and people get distracted. And I, hmm. and I thought, yeah, no, I don't like that either. And hmm. it's like, it's, it's okay. So I'm going to narrow it down to two things. Carrie, I, I have a story. I, mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have two, but they're short this week. I realized I double booked. Hmm. I told one person I would do <laughs> something, and it's like when I, it's all... like when I walk it's like when I walk out in my waiting room. Uh -huh. Oh, oof. and I and I have two patients there at the same time, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm so screwed. Uh huh. There's no. We're having group therapy today. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. I don't know okay. if I've told you guys about confessional communities, but we're going to do that today <laughs> <laughs> and see how you do with this little shift. Oh, yeah. So Yeah. And so at first, like I, I didn't realize it straight away. Like when I started to think, oh, 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 no. Duh. Mm. And I'm flooded, right? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's, and then as I'm looking at this calendar, at that calendar, I'm looking back at text messages. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you did. And, but it's gradual. And mm -hmm. then I start thinking of each party involved anticipating their reaction. What am I going to do? How can I possibly do both? Like, and then I thought about Robert when you were, when he first came into your office and at some point you said, are you open to, to discovering how your mind works and how, mm -hmm. and immediately that took me to curiosity. It took me mm -hmm. out of his depression and so then when I double booked, I'm like, huh, why is all this coming up? Like, why is this so, seems so devastating to me? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And coming from it, from curiosity, it was such a better experience than mm -hmm. everybody's going to hate me. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I can't really do anything because if everybody hates me, then I lose all my support. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to say no to everyone. That's what I'm going to say. No, no, because I don't want a chance double booking. It's, it's, it's wild. It's wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had a thing this week, um, yesterday, actually. Um, I was driving down my street coming home and Hope and I were, and I had to take her to the doctor or something. We were coming home and my neighbor and his wife were walking down the street. So I wrote on the window and I was teasing him a little bit because he just retired. He's about 63, just retired. And I'm, I'm, I was asking him what it was like to have such a, life. such a stress-free life and all this. And he just kind of looked at me in a nonverbal way. And I knew something was wrong. And he said, well, we've got some stresses and um, I'll tell you later. So I went down to the mailbox later on that day and he came out <clears throat> and we stood in his driveway and he said, I didn't really want to talk about this in front of hope because um, he said, I was diagnosed last week with prostate cancer. I've got three tumors. And he was, and my first reaction was to cuss, mm -hmm. which, and I did. And I thought it was yeah. appropriate. And I thought, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. but I yeah. sat and I, and I, 
I listened to him and he was visibly shaken. Mm. You know, it's relatively new news to him and he's very, very nervous about this and he's trying to gather information. So I just started asking him questions mm. and just trying to be present and, and listen to him because you can't say anything in that moment that's going to make anything better or anything like that. But I do think, and, and I think that, you know, it's kind of what we were talking about, um, the act of just listening and hearing mm. empathetically hearing the story, asking questions, engaging, um, and, and then praying and saying, you know, we will continue to pray about this. And, and, um, uh, there obviously doesn't fix anything, but there was a, I could feel a sense, a bit of, um, a crack of peace in him as we, mm -hmm as mm -hmm. we had this conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, well, I, I think yeah. I, I just, I, I'm just so struck by the nature of how our, you know, I mean, we, we might, if you were kind of like bring this really down to boots on the ground from a neurobiological and interpersonal standpoint, your, when your director made her comment to you, mm-hmm. See, she's not just stating a fact. In her question, what happened to the stairs or, or what happened to the elevator? Mm -hmm. Something wrong with the elevator. It's a question, but she's also naming, mm -hmm. my goodness, you've worked hard at this. Mm -hmm. Because unless you work really hard at what you just, at, at all the hard work that you did before you went on stage, like you wouldn't have been able to do this in such a way that I would notice that the elevator was off. There's this sense of like, she's joining you in the place where it's painful, where it's hard, where it's effortful. You join your neighbor. And it is in that place that when we, it's, it's the withness in our pain, in our suffering, that opens the door to telling the story differently. Hmm. Because otherwise I'm just locked in my own private room where the story just becomes like this, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, soundproof booth where it just like goes around and around and around and around in this booth and no, it doesn't get out to anybody like it. And I'm, and I'm stuck with me. And the story that I'm telling, but the moment that I say it to you and you, like, cause like, cause like we say, you know, there's, there's certain, certain words, certain cuss words, yep. that if we didn't, if we didn't have them in our vocabulary, we'd have to make them up. Right. Mm -hmm. I agree. And, you know, we kind of, That's we kind of somebody have a, did. Right. And we, we, we kind of have a hierarchy of the ones that we're like, oh, this is like, mm. this is a, you know, this is, this is single A, this is double A, this is triple A, this is major mm -hmm. league. Yeah. Yeah. And if, and if, and, and we, and we all know what the major league word is. Sure. But if we didn't have that word, like we'd have to make up one that would be, would, and, and, and if we could, we'd make up a word that would be worse than it, it would be harder than it because it's, it's how we join mm -hmm. in our grief with someone who themselves don't have words for their fear and their Mm -hmm. right sadness and you know like you were saying pep like you if you're gonna perform that moment of coming onto the stage after climbing the stairs you you wouldn't just take uh you know again 10 minutes before you do that and imagine walking from the great like and that's all the work no you're like it's, it's repeated over and mm -hmm. over and over again what you're doing is you are neurally reinforcing through neuroplasticity you're practicing you're wiring you're, you're firing to wire in such a way so that you become that grocery delivery man you're not just playing the role like you become him in that moment and this is why when it comes to our grief and when it comes to how we combat our shame Telling a new story requires that same degree of persevering mm -hmm. practice over and over and over again. So for your neighbor, that moment will be important and it will be important for him to have with others. 
yeah additional practiced moments yeah so that it becomes a story that is more compelling than the one my shame attendant is telling mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. amy did you have another story i do i'll tell it yeah, quickly yeah. um yeah. okay it, it kind of ties in with monitoring the cookies and <laughs> I, I'm so sorry. Like, it, that's just really true. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, so I was in a class and we were all talking about the projects that we were working on and the, the things, the progression and how, what we had gotten done. And all of us had things that we had gotten done. I shared mine, others shared theirs. The instructor called out two of the people and just praised them for what they had gotten done. And I'm like, my, my job lover. And my Amy, my Amy, I'm going to talk about my Amy, not you, not you, Amy, but my Amy, which is another Amy. And she lives I, in Miami. <laughs> but take it back. And I felt so young. Uh, and, and this is where it kind of ties in with the cookies. I felt so young in that want, wanting the instructor. I wanted to say, hello, like I need you to notice mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. I've accomplished. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that feels so young. And, and, and I don't know if this connects with, you said in the book, um, uh, I'll misquote it, but our anticipated future often comes from the age that we're, you could probably finish that for me, that we're mm -hmm. viewing it from, that our perspective mm -hmm. is from. And I felt mm -hmm. so young, like, mm -hmm. and I even mm -hmm. said to myself, Amy Chella, do you really need her to notice you? And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Right. That would be kind of like your attendant kind of like slips in and says like, hey, you don't really need that affirmation. Right. Come you don't on, really have anything to affirm anyway, right. but. Mm. Mm. But the anticipated future, what are you thinking, mm. Pep? You're, no, you're... I'm just, I'm soaking it in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, um, uh, I don't know if I'm, I, I'll just say this. I'm, I'm working on this other book project. Uh, and uh, hopefully down the line, we'll have another podcast series to talk about this, but it, 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 it involves the questions of suffering and questions of hope. Oh, another uplifting. Oh, well, there's hope. That's good. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Kurtz Oeuvre. The, the, the title, the Kurtz title, Oeuvre is, the, is the, the title is, shame, uh, sorry, the suffering. title is, the, the the title is the shame of hopeless suffering. Oh, <laughs> Hurry up! <laughs> yeah, uh, it's only going to be about a twenty page book. It's, it's sure. getting yeah, but this the, I I'm I'm thinking about this notion that that hope is if, if you when we imagine hope we we imagine hope as a function of what we think our future is to be. Like I'm hoping mm -hmm. in something, whether it's five minutes from now or five years or decades or whatever. Uh, but what's also interesting about that is that uh, this, this, you know, the stories that we live in, this is one other thing that we didn't, that, as part of, you know, being human storytellers, it does, uh, we, we utilize our capacity to imagine a past and imagine a future, right? Anytime you watch a good movie, you're not just watching it moment by moment by moment. You're taking in what's just happened mm. in the last five or 30 minutes, but you're also, you're anticipating what's coming, what's coming. What's, some movies are really, you know, kind of like I was thinking earlier today as we were approaching this, I'm thinking uh, when I saw, uh, as when I was, uh, I forget whatever, it would have been 1980 when The Empire Strikes Back was released I had never had a moment in a movie as I had at the end of the empire strikes back. And I mean, you know, whatever else your opinion is about that entire series of its, you know, script and all the things, it was one of the most gripping moments that I've ever had in watching a movie because it was so blindsiding. Like, I, I mean, I, there, there were people who were probably far smarter and who could have probably, who, who probably saw it coming and so forth. Like I wasn't one of them. And that whole sense of like, 
Oh, I wonder what happened to Luke's dad. Gosh, that, um, I'm sure that it will be will be told about that somewhere. Like that's what I'm anticipating. Like I did, that's not a future that I saw coming. Mm-hmm. Nor was it a future that he saw coming. And it changes everything about the future that he then thinks about. And that anticipated future cycles right back in and it is now shaping and telling the story of my present moment. And so this also becomes part of what's important for us is that we're telling stories in a way to change my future so that that anticipated future can also come back and change my present moment. Mm -hmm. Like when you have that moment, Pep, where the director says like, you know, what happened to the elevator? I can imagine that either in that moment or in the, you know, moments or hours or days or whatever that, that followed, there was a shift in your anticipated future. Like, you know, uh, oh, I've done, this is really important. This mm-hmm. is effective. It, it, it like, whether it's a matter of like, oh, I have greater confidence in my future because I'm, I'm clearly I'm, I'm doing so, which also then circles right back. It's like, oh, I'm, it, it informs what I'm now going to do, what I'm going to tell right now. Yeah. And I think the added interesting thing about that is had she not been intuitive, had she not been on, out in the yeah. audience and come back and said something, I wouldn't have had the same. My gosh. I would have known. Mm-hmm. Right. You right. know, the fact that she even shared with you. Yeah. I mean, that's makes all the difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That whole notion that our listeners are contributing. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, you know, we as listeners, whether, I mean, this is what's really important is that like, we are so often unaware of the significance of the role we play. Mm-hmm in the story that anybody else is telling who's in our presence at any given Mm -hmm. time. I mean, the clerk at Safeway. Uh, It's a whole, that's the whole, the whole thing behind It's a Wonderful Life, right? I mean, having no idea Mm -hmm. that you had any impact on anybody or anything and then being shown what your impact actually was. yeah, the trick is to be able to see it in real time. It'd be yeah. helpful. <laughs> yeah, it would be. Yeah, indeed. Okay. All right, guys. All right. This was fun. Right on. Shame can be fun. Time. I'm glad yeah. I'm doing it with you guys. <laughs> Shame, Shame can, be- can be fun. That's a bumper sticker. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. You too. Love right. you. Bye. Right. This podcast is produced by Kurt Thompson, Pepper Sweeney, and myself, Amy Chella. Audio production and editing is by Keaton Simons. Video production and editing is done by Mark Gould. If you'd like to connect with us, you can find us on social media at Being Known Pod. If you like this podcast, tell a friend. If you love this podcast, tell everyone you know. And please like, rate, and review wherever you listen. Be well, be now.